what do you think are the biggest differences between men's and women's fields in terms of etiquette and tactics? Number two, what are the biggest pieces of advice, if any, uh, on training or nutrition that you've heard or read that don't take women into consideration? So first question, Amber, uh, what do you think are the biggest differences between men's and women's fields in terms of etiquette and tactics? I love this question because the bottom line is the, the, the actual tactics and etiquette, it's exactly the same. So all of the principles are exactly the same. Um, all of the ways that you can be a good wheel, same for men, same for women. There really aren't any differences in terms of what it means to be a good wheel. And there aren't really any differences in terms of the tactical principles that you would apply in racing. Where the differences arise is that the, the constraints in men's races are different than the constraints in women's races. And so when you have different constraints, you need to apply those tactics differently. And that's for tactics. But on the, on the etiquette side, um, let me just say, so I don't, we could review some etiquette stuff, but I mean, I'll just pick off a few that I have here on a list, like just random things that are, you know, etiquette things in races. But again, these apply equally for men and women. So um, you want to hold your line in a sprint don't come off your line to block somebody from coming around you. Like that's a really basic etiquette thing. And it's the same for men and women, you know, don't attack in the feed zone. This is an etiquette thing for men and women. And, you know, not everybody abides by this, but this is, I mean, these are the things that, you know, really should be um, kind of should be, uh, uh, should be a part of everybody's approach to racing. Um, physical contact is not cool. It's just not, I mean, there are some limited cases where it becomes necessary because there's some fumble in the field. And I'll say like, even in the world tour, physical contact only happens very rarely and only in very limited circumstances. So generally speaking, it's just not cool. And it's the same for men as it is for women. Brake checking, never cool. Same for men, same for women. Generally just good sportsmanship is always appreciated. Um, and I could go on and on about this, but the point is, the etiquette rules are the same for men and women. What I will say is that the particular transgressions of etiquette are probably very different in men's fields than they are in women's fields. It's funny and, that you mentioned that because every <laughs> single lap at Valley of the Sun, just like full testosterone rage attacks were going on in the feed zone. <laughs> just like every single lap. I was like, come on, I thought we were supposed to do this, but gosh, it was, yeah, just yeah. brutal. <laughs> the testosterone effect is real and that I know I'm painting with a very broad brush here, but um, sometimes stereotypes exist for a reason and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> um, and, and that said, like there are exceptions to everything. So I've seen my fair share of headbutting, even punching, body checking and cussing in more languages than I can count. Uh, but generally speaking, I think the transgressions of those etiquette rules, um, even though the rules themselves are the same, how they're being broken in the different fields is probably quite different from men's fields versus women's fields. And I will also say that those trans transgressions also differ, differ between the U S and Europe. So there is a regional component to this as well as a gender component to this. Um, but it really just, I mean, it depends on the group dynamics of where you are, who's in the field. Um, and again, that testosterone effect is, it is real. So tactics, similarly, it's the same principles. But again, you have different constraints that lead you to need to apply the tactics in different way, right, ways. So for men and women, every race demands the deployment of a unique combination of tactics because every race is different. So even if you're doing the same race every year, you're going to have a different field. Your fitness is going to be different as is the fitness of everybody else in the field. The weather is going to be different. The wind is going to be different. You're on different equipment. All of these things mean that every single race you do is different. So even though you were applying the same tactical principles, the way that you apply those in given circumstances is going to change depending on the circumstances of the race. So let's look at some of those different constraints. Women's races tend to have smaller fields. This, especially when you're looking at smaller local and regional races means that you almost, you, it's very rare that you even have teams. So you almost always have a collection of individuals who are not employing team tactics in a race, which that's a huge constraint already. And then you have fewer matches to burn. So if you don't have a team of, let's say six riders who are all racing for one athlete, that's, that's, that's a lot of matches that you don't have to burn. So when you're racing as an individual, you just have fewer matches to burn. And when you have a collection of individuals, there are just fewer matches to burn in the race as a whole. Um, 
shorter distances. Some women's races tend to be even, especially in criteriums, they tend to be shorter time. Like even if it's a time, our races are usually like 45 minutes to 50 minutes plus a lap is a lot shorter than a lot of the men's races, which can be over an hour, hour and a half. Um, so the shorter distance, the shorter distances demand those impose different constraints for women as well. Um, and then again, like we don't have those testosterone driven dynamics um, that a lot of the men's races do. So I'll just share a quick story. We had a director sportif one year who came over from the men's side of the sport was directing us at one of our first races uh, during the season. And we were on a circuit that was, um, it was a circuit race and there was a really, really steep hill in it. So it was going to, the power demands of that hill were astronomical, which again, impact the tactics of how one is going to apply your tactical principles in the race. Anyway, this DS was coming from the men's side of things. What he wanted to do, his goal was to initiate a flurry of attacks, like get the whole field just on a wave of attacking after attacking after attacking. And apparently in men's races, all you have to do is throw down a couple of attacks and <laughs> <laughs> that, verified. The field, <laughs> the field goes nuts, right? <laughs> on the women's side, it's not like that. We don't have that like testosterone chip thing going on on the shoulder. It's more like, so the DS instructed us. He said, okay, I want you two to attack and that's going to get the field going and then we'll do X, Y, Z. Well, it was funny because we all kind of looked at each other like, I don't think that's really ever happened in the history of women's racing. Like, you know, we, it's the dynamics are just different. So we did attack and the rest of the field just looked at us like you guys are freaking crazy because <laughs> like you're wasting all of these Watts when you're going to have to put out all this power on this steep pitch that's coming up every lap. And sure enough, nobody countered us and we just attacked ourselves silly until we were dead and <laughs> couldn't make up the hill anymore. And it was a big bust. Um, but that's an example of, the tactical principle is the same, but the application and the outcome is going to be really different because the constraints are different. The dynamics are different. Um, so I want to just address what you said about being fast in the last two laps, because this is a really interesting point that I think illustrates a lot of what I'm talking about. So for a race to go fast in the last two laps, someone has to create that speed. So if you have a bigger field, you have higher speed because number one, you have more total horsepower in the race. You just have more engines putting out watts, right? You also have more room to surf and recover. So let's say you did an effort. If you did an effort and you got caught and you floated back in the field, the field's pretty long. So as you're floating back through the field, you're, st you have a long way where you're still getting draft and you have a lot of opportunity to jump back in that draft and recover. In other words, you have a lot more places to hide. So you also, when you have a bigger field, it's more likely that you're going to have teams with teammates. So you're going to have teams that have teammates that are willing to go on the attack to lift the speed because they're not going for the finish. They're setting up a teammate. So that's another way that you can have that higher speed at the end of a race where um, it's more likely and it's easier to do when you have a bigger field in those last, those closing laps of a race. In a women's race, we have a really small field. I mean, imagine a race where, like you're saying, you only have 10 riders. I'm guessing they're not teammates. So there's a much bigger risk for those late race, those late race efforts. It's easier to get dropped because if you go on the attack and you get caught and there's only nine people chasing you, there's not a lot of draft to jump back into and recover and be able to take a crack at the finish line again. So it's a much higher risk to put down an attack. Um, and there's also a higher psychological risk. Let's say you do put down that attack and that you get caught. It's really the chances of you recovering enough to, to contest the finish again without getting dropped are pretty low if you've really committed to that effort. And so visually, it's so much more obvious that you're getting dropped from the field than if you're in a field, if you're, if you're in a field of 10 versus if you're a dude, you throw down some crazy attack, you've got 50 people in the field and you drift back through the field. It's not as visually obvious that you got dropped and there's a, still a good chance that you can just catch in at the tail end and finish with the group. So there's a higher risk tactically, but there's also a higher psychological risk to it, which is part of why I think women do slow down in those closing laps of race, because tactically the, the risk, the, the cost benefit ratio is very, very different when you're in a small field. So I'm not at all surprised by that. And it doesn't mean that the women aren't racing appropriately, or they're not racing tactically, they're applying the same exact tactics appropriately to different constraints. So when you're talking about going to those bigger races, like you mentioned, you said when the fields are larger and a higher caliber, my fitness isn't strong enough to accelerate the speed and survive to the end. Um, 
I have a feeling it has less to do with your fitness and more to do with the fact that you're in a bigger group that can hold higher speed. And that's because when you're in a bigger field with faster speed, that faster speed is going to amplify the cost of even small mistakes. So we talk about the accordion effect of like going through corners. If you're not in the top third of the field, you're really going to have to slow down and hit the brakes going into the turn, which means you're going to have to really reaccelerate harder coming out the turn. And that taxes you so much over the course of a race that it doesn't like, even if your fitness is really good, if you're not positioning yourself, well, you're going to be wasting a lot of energy and it's going to make it so much harder to get to the finish. So there's a skill component of that, that there's a higher demand of skill that comes with that bigger field and that higher speed. And then not to mention the fact that all of that positioning, more riders, more speed, that's all going to increase your cognitive load, which is going to be sapping your energy stores as well. So my guess is that it's less to do with your fitness and more to do with the cognitive load and the skill set that it's demanding different things of you because of these different constraints that is really what's making it more difficult to get to the end of the race. So you can increase your fitness, right? So that when you're making those mistakes and they're costing you, um, you, you can really, you, you have more buffer to weather those mistakes, but also working on skills will help you do more with, with the, fit, the fitness you have. So I wouldn't, you know, don't, don't get too down on your fitness per se. Just know that there's a lot of other demands that come with racing in a bigger, faster field. Um, and that, you know, are going to be drawing on other resources, mental, positional skills wise that don't necessarily have to do with your fitness. Um, Amber, everything you just said rings totally true to men's racing too. And huh. there's, there's, there's so many times where you race an 11 person field in 35 plus four or five and the exact same stuff happens. Um, and I, my note, so I've raced a bunch of different categories and the difference, it's so true, is the, the P12, there's the team. So it is, it is fast the whole time at the end. And what they're trying to do is make sure that that slingshot doesn't happen. They don't want anyone to slingshot and get a gap. Is that the same in women's pro racing when they're going fast at the end? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, and two, when you say that, like, you know, you attack, if there's a the slow down and you attack solo and there's a bunch of individuals, this is, happens in a men's breakaway too where maybe it's more likely that they, that them in the pack, they look at each other. Mm -hmm. Is that, that happened too? Because if they bridge that, what happens is uh, they are then too tired for the finish. If they close that gap and then someone yeah. else will win where it's a teammate, same thing. Yep, exactly. And so this is a perfect illustration. It's not about men versus women. It's about using the same tactical principles and applying them differently depending on the constraints. So would it be fair to say then too, if it's a, I say anyone who's racing a smaller field and it's individuals. And I think even if they have the same Jersey and our experience on the men's side, maybe this is different <laughs> on the female side, but on the men's side, if they have the same Jersey and they're in like cat four. They're not a team. It's just, <laughs> it's just a bunch of individuals. <laughs> is that happen in women's racing too? Do you see yeah. that? Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, you might have teammates and they're not, but they're racing as individuals. So tactically speaking, it's you're in a, in a, field for full of individuals. So, so Riza in the chat said, Nate, you're the problem on this because I, I talked about the counter attack, which is fine. But I want to go back to that because she's like implying that what I said was not correct. If it's a lap or two to go, the field slows down and you can slingshot past and it's a bunch of individuals and it's a small race mm -hmm. and that's a good power profile. You're not like a sprinter. Is that a good yeah. move or not? Totally a good move. Totally a good move. And the reason it's a good move is like you said, if it's a bunch of individuals, you don't have teammates that are specifically there to sacrifice themselves for somebody else. So that means that anybody committing to chase you is having to take on that risk of, is this the right use of my energy? So people are going to look at each other and they're going to wait for somebody else to, to start the chase, which will give you an advantage. Um, so, and the other thing is, you know, especially if you're attacking from the back, you get that element of surprise. It's, it's definitely... I 100% agree with you. I think that the drawback and the reason we don't see the more of that happening is because there is that higher psychological risk of if this doesn't work out, it's going to feel really embarrassing because, and let me be clear, it's not embarrassing. If you get dropped because you threw cool. down a monster attack, you know, good on you. Like you committed to it. And I, but I, you know, I, I understand that feeling. I, I get it. But just remember like racing is for fun. Racing is for trying things and seeing what works. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And it's, you know, 
yes, it's a little bit harder to do that in front of a crowd, but honestly, like no one's going to judge you harshly for that. They're, what they're going to judge is they're going to appreciate the courage of that move, not, you know, think less of you because you happen to yeah. get dropped. It, sorry, Joe, let me just say this. I think it's like two different uh, mindsets. One is racing not to get dropped and one mm-hmm. is racing to win. And if you race to win, you're going to get dropped sometime. And if you yes. never get dropped in a race, you're, you're most likely either in the wrong category or you're not racing to win. If you're, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? That's, that's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. The thing that I was going to add to this, that, that just kind of what you were just saying there, Amber, as far as what other people think of, of your moves in a race, that does control probably too much of what we do in a race a lot of the time, especially, you know, if you're like, have cameras on your bike and you're going to have people watching your races on YouTube, uh, you know, ask me how I know, but <laughs> that, <laughs> this like, it definitely controls the way we do things and it probably shouldn't. This is just for everybody because the one thing that I've found is like, like you said, Amber, there are certain principles that govern success in a race. Like they're always there. Circumstances change. And then that changes how we use those principles. But it's really hard to sit from the sidelines and then say exactly what should have been done. And just to say like, Oh, well, you, I don't know why you did this. You should have done that. And I see that a ton with women's racing. Mm-hmm. Men always say like, women don't know how to race. They weren't doing the moves that I would do, right? Because <laughs> I can see this race on the outside in, and I know exactly right. what should have happened. And men do this with men's racing. I'm sure women do it with women's racing too. The, the point that I'm getting at is it's really tough to know what the right decision was for each person because it's evolving and changing so rapidly. And, and there's certain things that we just don't pick up on. And it's funny, we've noticed that when we do race analysis and we all sit down to then talk about the race, and we get insight from the racer when we actually see that and we're like, Oh, that's why, like just mm-hmm. watching it from the outside in, I was wondering why that happened or why you didn't do X, but now I see why you did this or, Oh, it turns out that that was a good decision or something else. So, um, I'll just take kind of like a harsh position. Dudes quit looking at women's <laughs> racing and saying like, they just don't race right. I, you know, if they should have done this and this because that's what I would have done. Like enough with the man explaining on that. Um, on the next question that she has, what are the biggest pieces of it? Oh, Nate, do you have something? I, I just have, yeah, because I love tactics. I think you know yeah. this. The, the one thing too that I think is unique to women's racing at the amateur level that I see in Northern California is like the P12 or P213 race will have maybe 10, 11 riders, but three of them will be on a pro Connie team. And <laughs> they race tactically. And I don't know how you beat that. Like when I see that and it's a real team, like, I feel so bad for the other woman in that race because they they always have somebody off the front and then they're either like sitting on the front soft pedaling or they're just like letting other people do the work and yeah. it's and then they counter and it's it's like it, you have any tips on that Amber? It's hard to race against, but it's an amazing way to learn. And you know, again, you can just use it as a learning opportunity. Try something. If it doesn't work, next time try something else. I mean, it's 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 a bike race. It's not you know this is there will be more bike races. And if it doesn't work out, you've learned something, you know, and if it does work out, you've learned something potentially more valuable. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, and I think it's fun to watch. And then um, to your point, Jonathan, I think it's, this applies in both cases is actually, you know, debriefing after a race can be really helpful. So sometimes somebody who is watching your race from the outside looking in might notice something that you didn't, but it has to be a two way conversation because you need to have both sides of that perspective. So, you know, mansplaining is where you're just like, Oh, you should have done this or just do this. And actually I did a, a clinic with Mo Bruno Roy, who's a former cyclocross pro. And she had this brilliant point about the word just it's so annoying because it's just, <laughs> it just, it invalidates all of the struggle, all of, you know, so, if, if you if you just watch somebody race a, a bike race and you say, oh, you just should have done this. Are, I mean, yeah. are you joking? It invalidates yeah. every every struggle, every decision that was made, everything, you know, that was difficult about that thing. And just it just railroads it. And so, you know, acknowledge the fact that everybody in the race is doing the best that they can. Everybody is making the best decision with the information available to them at that time. And then the debrief, you can learn a lot from it, but again, it has to be a two-way conversation about it. And it's not, you know, you're never going to come up with like the right answer, but there can be some learnings from that conversation. And to your point, Nate, if you're racing with a bunch of pros, go and talk to them after the race. Hey, I noticed you did this thing. I'm not really, you know, I, I didn't really understand why you did it at a time. Can you explain it to me? Man, you can learn a lot from that. It'd be, you know, it, 
it is hard to race against, but again, great learning opportunity. In, in that situation, and it's going to be depending on what kind of rider you are, but if that happened in the men's field, Amber, I want your opinion on this. What I would do is try to be in the breakaway with that solo rider and then pretend like I'm just happy to be here and I'm barely <laughs> holding on the whole time because um, I don't want that rider to like just sit on my wheel because that would be, that's like to like negative, they call that like negative racing where they would just sit mm -hmm. on my reel and waiting for a solo. Um, and hopefully they think that they can beat me at the finish, but that might get you top two. And then hopefully, I don't know. What, what, what would you, you do in that situation? I would, I, would, I would probably do that because the team is controlling the race, essentially. So whether or not they're going to allow you to stay in that break and let that break go is going to depend largely on whether you're willing to work it. So you'd better be willing to work it. But I think it, you know, in, that, in that scenario, it's best if, if they totally underestimate you. So you might want to pretend to pedal squares, drag your tongue on the road, you know, drink a lot, eat a lot. Um, kind of pretend like you're really in the box, but boy, you're committed to being here because you're just so psyched to be in a break with a pro and then bust out your moves at the end. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're not willing to work that break and there's three of them in the field and they're the only team there and they're really strong, they have no problem bringing that, letting that come back and trying to reshuffle and get a break that'll go with somebody who will work. So that's probably what I would do. I want to race. So bad now. <laughs> I miss it. <laughs> so her question, what are the biggest pieces of advice, if any, uh, for training or nutrition that you've heard or read that don't take women into consideration? Oh, there's so much. Um, <laughs> there's so much. But the, the, the good thing is like, again, you know, even going back to this discussion of ta tactics and etiquette, like most of these things just apply across the board. We all have mitochondria that are going to get more efficient when we train. We all have cardiovascular systems that are going to respond and adapt to higher training loads. Like most things um, generally do apply. So there are some things that are very different. And the first thing I would say is just in general, if you're getting advice from anyone, including me, uh, consider the source and take it with a grain of salt. So um, just because somebody gives you advice about a race or how to train or what to eat, um, you know, really consider the source. It doesn't mean that it's something that you need to do. You're welcome to take it into consideration. You're welcome to try it and see if it works for you. But just know that there's no secret formula. No one has all the answers. Um, and just, you know, get curious about your own process and figure out what's going to work for you. Uh, so some more specific points that I've, I've noticed is if you're a bike racer, which you are, train for your races. Uh, women's races don't tend to be that long. So there's no need to go ride six hours if your longest race is going to be three hours. And that's assuming that you do road racing. If you just do crits and your races are 45 to 50 minutes and they're all going to be under an hour, you know, the volume that you need to train is considerably lower than it would be for guys who might be doing races up to four hours. And I know there's lots of bros that like to flex with big epic distances. Um, and honestly, big epic rides can be super fun. They're like a really fun adventure. It could be a really fun way to mix it up mentally, but just know that it's not an effective training strategy for you. And so you don't necessarily need to be doing the kind of volume that men are doing, especially since they're racist and since they're longer. Um, the other one that I see a lot, and this does apply to men and women, but I think on the women's side in particular, I'll just say you don't have to have a certain body type or shape to win bike races. Um, women in particular, I think even more so than men, our bodies do not conform to the norms of what we consider a stereotypical cyclist body. And when you look at even the top women at the world tour level, they are all kinds of shapes, all kinds of heights, all kinds of sizes, and you can make it work. So, you know, train your engine, train your mind, focus on training that race intuition, but chase performance and not a certain shape or a certain number on the scale. I think this is really, really important for women. Um, another one that's making the rounds on the internet, uh, and we've talked about this, um, inter intermittent fasting is a big thing right now. It doesn't work for women the same way that it does for men because of our different hormonal landscape. It doesn't, and I'm not saying it's not going to work for you. It's just that you really need to take it with a grain of salt. And just because some of your training buddies might be doing intermittent fasting and having really great results with it, it doesn't mean it's going to affect you in the same way. So again, you really need to consider the source, do some homework on this. Um, if you want to try it, try it. But again, don't expect to have the same results as men. The other one, your menstrual cycle affects your training. 
And even if you don't get a regular period or you don't get a period, those monthly fluctuations in hormones will affect your training. This is not something that's going to make or break a race. It doesn't necessarily have to make or break a training session even, uh, but there is an effect. And so it's worth taking time to track that and, and learning about your body and how that does affect you and how that might, you know, how it might affect how your body responds to training. So those are some kind of key points I'll say. Um, there's probably a lot more, but <laughs> Amber, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.